Good day, friends. Welcome once again to our series, The Search for Light, Truth, Hope and Meaning. Today's presentation is really a continuation of the previous one. We are looking at science and the Bible. Today's topic is From Ape to Man, The Search for Our Origins. Can we as Christians really believe what the Bible teaches about the origin of life? Is the story of Adam and Eve just a myth? Man has long pondered his similarity to the ape. And here we see a statue of an ape pondering his own ancestry, sitting upon Darwin's book and upon the Bible. In the previous presentation, we saw that Charles Darwin brought about a paradigm shift. Darwin promoted a radically different view of origins. He believed in evolution by natural selection. And that means that our ancestors were ape-like creatures. And these apes gradually developed and became human. In the previous presentation, we also looked at evidences that support the creation theory. We looked at order, complexity, and the miracle of life itself. We looked at the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. We looked at mathematical probability. And you will remember Sir Fred Hoyle said, the probability of life having arisen spontaneously by evolution is equal to the probability that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard would assemble a Boeing 747. And then we looked at the origin of the DNA code. And we asked the question, who wrote the book of instructions? And then finally, we looked at the fossil record itself. And we saw that there was an acute absence of transitional forms. Life seems to have appeared suddenly, completely formed. The famous evolutionist and paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould said the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. In any local area a species does not arise gradually by the gradual transformation of its ancestors. It appears all at once and fully formed. And so today we want to have a look at how man began. The search for our origins. Would you like to know what our great, 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 great grandpa looked like? Well, here he is. Isn't he cute? This is the tree shrew. And notice that this little fellow can use his hands very effectively. And so, through the line of creatures like the tree shrews, the mammals continued to develop until we had the chimpanzees forming and gradually these chimpanzees would walk upright on the way to becoming a man. Well, let's visit the Pretoria Zoo and let's go to the primate section. Uh, let's move to the area that houses the orangutans. And let's ask a baby orangutan how he feels about being our ancestors. Well, as you can see, he didn't look too pleased about that. He looked quite electrified. Now let's go to Grandpa Orangutan and let's ask him the same question. How do you feel about being the ancestor of man? Well, you can see he didn't like the idea too much. He didn't want to listen to this at all. But friends, the evolutionary theory teaches that apes gave rise to man. Slowly but surely, they began to use tools and they began to walk more and more upright. And of course, the brain continued to develop and became bigger and bigger. Here we see a photograph of the famous paleoanthropologist Raymond Dart. He was a professor of anthropology at Witts University and is famous for discovering this skull known as the Town Child in 1924. Here we see the skull next to man's skull. You will immediately notice that the skull is considerably smaller. The cranial capacity was less than half that of modern man. But Raymond Dart believed that the teeth of this individual, which he called 
Australopithecus africanus, which means southern ape man, the teeth were more man-like. And so he believed that these little creatures were on the way to becoming humans. And then in 1959, another famous anthropologist by the name of Louis Leakey was digging in the Olduvai Gorge region of East Africa. And as you can see, the Olduvai Gorge is found in northern Tanzania, just east of Lake Victoria. Here we see Professor Louis Leakey with some of the skulls that he discovered. And this, of course, was the most famous one. He named it Zingentropus boisei. It was very ape-like. Here we see another photograph of this skull and a reconstruction on the right. You can clearly see that this was an ape. Notice the low forehead, the sagittal crest at the top of the head, obviously there to support the strong jaw muscles. It is very clearly ape-like. However, Louis Leakey said that its teeth were more man-like. If you compare the teeth of an ape to that of man, you will notice the man's teeth are more rounded, whereas an ape, like the gorilla, is more U-shaped, and it has very well-developed canines and extremely large molars. And so Louis Leakey believed that the teeth of Zingentropus were more man-like, except for the molars, which were more robust. And from the skull, the artists painted these pictures, indicating that these individuals were bipedal. They were standing upright, and they were using tools like stones and other things. But friends, when artists reconstruct or draw these creatures, a lot of creativity and imagination is involved. We see this by the way different artists draw these creatures. For example, at the top we see Zingentropus as drawn for the Sunday Times, April 5, 1964. On the right hand side we see the same creature as drawn by a prominent scientist. And at lower left, the same creature drawn for National Geographic. So you can see a lot depends on imagination and creativity. Louis Leakey's son, Richard Leakey, discovered many more of these creatures. And it was renamed. It was decided that this was also an Australopithecine, a southern ape. But it was a more robust type of creature compared to the one discovered by Raymond Dart. And so they renamed it as Australopithecus robustus. Now, if you look at the creature, you will notice once again the low forehead, the sagittal crest at the top of the head, the large eyebrows above the orbits. This was very clearly an ape-like creature. And then in 1974, this man by the name of Donald Johansson made a major discovery that shocked the world. He was working in Ethiopia at a place called Hadar. Here we see the fossil-bearing sediments of Ethiopia's Hadar formation. And here is a picture of Donald Johansson and his team excavating at the site. Here is the creature that Donald Johansson found. He named it Lucy because he believed it was a female. Now Johansson made great claims and big boasts about this creature. It was quite small, just three feet or one meter tall. And it was dated by the evolutionists at three million years old. Here we see the creature. And you can see once again that it is very, very ape-like. They were small. They had small brains. They had large canine teeth. And they had a strongly sloping face. This creature, which Johansson named Australopithecus afarensis, was 40% complete. Johansson believed that Lucy was an ape from the neck up, but that she walked upright. This, however, was based on fragmentary evidence. He looked at the ratio of the arms to the legs, and he concluded that the ratio 
was in between that of an ape and a modern man. But friends, how can you work out ratios with so many pieces of bone missing? Just look at the fragmentary evidence. But he believed that these creatures were bipedal. They walked upright. And he based it on the knee joint and on the pelvic bones. But what Johansson doesn't tell you is that the knee was found in a strata below the one in which he was working and at some distance away. Almost as if a vehicle had crashed into this creature at high speed, carrying the lower legs some distance away. Here we see an artistic conception of Australopithecus afarensis. Once again, we need to remember that there is a lot of imagination involved here. I want you to note the contemplative gaze and the human hands and the use of tools. Here we see the skull of Australopithecus afarensis. Notice the shovel-like shape of the head, the sloping face, the large eyebrow ridges. Notice also that there is no nasal bone. If you feel the top of your nose, you will feel the nasal bone. Apes don't have a nasal bone. Also, if you put your finger under your nose and push upwards, you will find a little bony ridge there called the nasal spine. Apes do not have a nasal spine. This skull is very clearly an ape's skull. If you look a little closer at the side view of an ape and a human skull, you can see the slope. Notice the slope of the ape skull, but the human skull is upright. Here we see it clearly. Once again, notice the slope within Australopithecus afarensis. Here is another reconstruction of this creature. Once again, highly creative and a lot of imagination goes into this. But notice the nose. There's no nasal bone. There's no nasal spine. This is clearly an ape. Here we see a reconstruction of Lucy within the St. Louis Zoo. Here this creature is given an ape-like head, but a human body. When we look at the body itself, we notice the trunk, the breasts, and the genitals. Notice the arms and the hands. They're very human-like. Notice the legs and the feet. Very human-like. Notice the posture and gait. And notice the pensive gaze. The finger bones are straight. The whole hand is clearly human-like. Here we once again see a close-up view of this pensive gaze, almost as if Johansson saw a fossilized thought in this creature. And here is Lucy's human-like foot. Have you ever seen a foot like that before? Sure, just kick off your shoes, take a closer look. Maybe not quite so hairy, but that is a reconstruction of a very human-like foot. Friends, this is a complete misrepresentation of how Lucy actually looks. You see, hominid evolution is data poor and imagination rich. Further research was done on this creature, and in Science News, April 8, 2000, we read the following. Australopithecus and amensis and Australopithecus afarensis. The latter represented by the famous skeleton known as Lucy had wrists capable of locking the hands in place during knuckle walking. So these were knuckle walking apes like gorillas and chimpanzees. Australopithecus afarensis had long curved hands and feet. Once again, here we have a quote from experts in their field, J. Stern and R. Sussman. There is no evidence that any extinct primate has long, curved, heavily muscled hands and feet for any purpose other than to meet the demands of full or part-time arboreal life. That means life in the trees. Here on Discover magazine, we see Lucy walking. The dark bones are based on Lucy. The light areas of the bones are an interpretation. Remember, the evidence is fragmentary. And then Mary Leakey, the wife of Louis Leakey, discovered these important footprints. They are known as the Latoli footprints. 
They were discovered in 1972 and the evolutionists dated them at 3.7 million years. The trail was 73 feet long, consisting of 20 larger footprints and 27 smaller footprints. A third set of tiny footprints were placed on top of each of the largest ones, as if the child was walking in the footprints of the parent. Now friends, these footprints are clearly human footprints. The big toe is in line with the foot. The small toes cling to the ground. There was a well-developed arch and the weight was carried from the heel around the lateral side of the foot, as indicated in this photograph. So the Laetoli footprints were entirely human. Unlike the ape footprint, they showed a well-developed arch and no divergence of the big toe. You see, in apes, the big toe is found on the side of the foot, not so in humans. There could be no doubt that the Laetoli hominids were upright and bipedal, with a free striding gait 3.7 million years ago. So these true hominid footprints were older than Lucy. Johansson himself made the following comment, make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. If one were left in the sand of a California beach today and a four-year-old were asked what it is, he would instantly say that somebody had walked there. He wouldn't be able to tell it from a hundred other footprints on the beach, nor would you. The external morphology is the same. None of Lucy's foot bones have been preserved, but other specimens show that Australopithecus afarensis could not have made the trail at Laetoli, as their toes were too long and curved, and they had the same knuckle-walking wrist anatomy as chimpanzees and gorillas. What is more, CAT scans of their inner ear canals, which reflect posture, and their long curved fingers and toes show that they did not walk upright. Professor Sir Zolly Zuckerman from the University of Birmingham, a highly respected anatomist, has carefully examined the bones of Lucy, and he concluded that Lucy did not walk upright. Dr. Charles Oxner from the University of Southern California also examined many, many bones of this creature. And he concluded these creatures had a mode of locomotion similar to the orangutan, not like man at all. And then in 2006, this skull was discovered. This is the oldest child ever discovered, a three-year-old Australopithecus afarensis girl from Dikika in Ethiopia's Afar region. The infant had long curved fingers that raise more questions about the importance of arboreal behavior in this species. And then an article appeared in Scientific American, September 2006. And the heading was, Lucy's baby, a stunning new human fossil. But in this article, they show that the shoulder blades and the neck vertebrae were like a gorilla. The inner ear canals, like apes. The long curved fingers, like tree-dwelling apes. The voice box, like a chimpanzee's. And the cranial capacity, like a chimp. Now friends, please notice, gorilla, ape, ape, chimpanzee, chimp. And yet, the title reads, Lucy's baby a stunning new human fossil. Friends, this is deception. It is ape man deception. And it is not true science. Johansson firmly believed that the knee joint of Afarensis, of Lucy, was like that of a man. And therefore, he said, this creature walked upright. Well, let's take a closer look. On the right-hand side, we see the legs and the pelvic girdle of a chimp. Please notice that the legs come down almost vertically. But in a human, the femurs come inwards. In other words, we are knock-kneed. And then the tibias go straight down. This angle represented by the green arrow is what we call the carrying angle or the valgus. And in man, 
that angle is 9 degrees. Johansson found that Lucy's carrying angle or valgus was 15 degrees. But when you look at the gorilla and the chimp, the carrying angle is 0 degrees. And so he concluded that Lucy was walking upright like man. Let's see if I can explain this in a slightly different way. As human beings, we tend to be knock-kneed. Our femurs come in and then our tibias go straight down to the floor. A chimpanzee, on the other hand, his legs are almost vertical. Now this helps us, as human beings, to balance and walk properly. You see, if I had straight legs and I had to lift one of the legs, notice what happens. I immediately fall over to the side. So that is why our femurs come in and then the tibias go down. It's to help with balance. It brings my weight over my legs. Now a chimp is not like that and that is why when a chimp walks he will move from side to side. He's trying to keep his weight over the center line. Now in the case of Lucy she was similar to us according to Johansson. But Johansson forgets that Lucy could have been an arboreal ape in the trees. Now if you're in a tree, an ape would tend to walk on the branches and at the same time hold branches at the top. That is why Lucy has the carrying angle that is similar to man. He's trying to balance himself. So the carrying angle or the valgus of a human is 9 degrees, but a gorilla and a chimp has no carrying angle. Lucy, however, has a carrying angle of 15 degrees. But if we look at the orangutan and the spider monkey that are tree dwellers, their carrying angle is exactly the same as man, 9 degrees. So the carrying angle really doesn't tell us much. J. Stern and Swizman, in 1983 American Journal of Physical Anthropology, they say the following. We must agree with Tardieu that the overall structure of the knee is compatible with a significant degree of arboreal locomotion. You see, friends, if Lucy was living in the trees, he would walk on the branches like a tightrope walker, sometimes hanging onto branches that are above. And so this carrying angle helps him, like the spider monkey, to do that. What is more, the iliac blades in the pelvis of Lucy are short and wide. They have a distinct flair compared to that of man. It is very similar to that of a chimp. Stern and Sussman once again, the fact that the anterior portion of the iliac blade faces laterally in humans but not in chimpanzees is obvious. The marked resemblance of Lucy to the chimpanzee is equally obvious. And so friends, once again we see the evidence is pointing to the fact that Lucy or Australopithecus afarensis was merely an ape. Stern and Sussman once again, it suggests to us that the mechanism of lateral pelvic balance during bipedalism was closer to that in apes than in humans. And then in 1972, this famous skull was discovered by Richard Leakey and his team. It was called Skull 1470. That was the accession number to the Nairobi Museum. It was discovered in Takana, Kenya. And it was initially called Homo habilis. But since then, it has been changed to Homo 
Rudolfensis. Now, when dated, it was found to be about 3 million years old using the evolutionary time scale. It was found to be older or at least contemporaneous with Australopithecus. So here we have a true hominid living at the same time as the Australopithecines. The Homo rudolfensis skull was later revised down to 1.9 to 2.4 million years. You see, it didn't fit their pattern. And so the scale or the age was revised. For a long time, the oldest known human ancestor was thought to be a primitive species, dating back 1.8 million years ago, called Homo erectus. They had smaller heads, prominent eyebrows, and they stood upright. But now researchers had discovered an even older species of human called Homo habilis that may have coexisted with Homo erectus. Now it seems Homo rudolfensis was around too and raises the distinct possibility that many other species of human also existed at the same time. You see, friends, these could have just been different varieties of hominids all living at more or less the same time. This find of Skull 1470 is part of a growing body of evidence that challenges the view that our species evolved in a smooth linear progression from our primate ancestors. So says one of the paleoanthropologists. According to Meave Leakey, that is the wife of Richard Leakey, of the Tacona Basin Institute in Nairobi, these finds show that there was a diversity early on in the hominids. And scientists believe that climate change had a major impact on the development of early humans. And so, friends, when we look at this carefully, as we see from the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, there are two basic lines here. At the top, you see the hominid group of fossils, and to the lower left we see the Australopithecine group. Is it possible that this was a separate kind that was created by God, but are now extinct? If we look at Richard Leakey's book on origins, he has a similar presentation. Here we see two lines. We see the Australopithecus group, and we see the hominid group. But if we go back, where is the common ancestor? Were these not just two separate groups with variety within each group? Here is another representation of the evolution of man. Please notice the many dotted lines. The evidence is very, very fragmentary. Where are the transitionary forms? And if you look carefully, you will see two distinct lines. Again, on the left, we have the Australopithecines, and on the right, we have the hominids. Australopiths were contemporaneous with humans and are thus regarded as a side branch. They could not have been on the ancestral line of modern humans. And so, friends, which view fits the facts? The evolutionary tree with one common ancestor or a creation forest where we have different kinds created by God and then variations, microevolution taking place in each kind. Daniel E. Lieberman, another face in our family tree, an article in Nature, volume 410, March 2001 says the following, until a few years ago, the evolutionary history of our species was thought to be reasonably straightforward, but lately confusion has been sown in the human evolutionary tree. The confusion now looks set to increase still further. Let's look at a few other discoveries. Here we see the skull of the famous or infamous Piltdown Man. He was discovered by Charles Dawson. The fossils were dug up outside Piltdown, so it is claimed, in Sussex in 1912. 
But this skull, dear friends, was declared a hoax in 1953. For more than 40 years, this skull deceived the scientific community. In this 1916 reconstruction, Piltdown Man was supposed to have used tools. And here we see a reconstruction of Piltdown Man. But when some scientists looked at the skull more closely, they found that the skull itself was human, but an ape jaw had been attached to the bottom. It had been treated with special chemicals, and its teeth had been very carefully filed down. So this was a hoax, but it fooled the scientific community for more than 40 years. Why? Because this is what they were looking for. This is what they wanted to find, a link between ape and man. What was the evidence? A piece of jaw, two molar teeth, and a piece of skull. And yet, a very confident interpretation was given. A discovery of supreme importance was announced at the Geological Society on 18 December 1912. A part of the most ancient inhabitant of England, if not of Europe, the remains thus far recovered leave no possible doubt but that they represent a man who must be regarded as affording us a link with our remote ancestors, the apes. And then in 1922, a tooth was found in America, and this caused a great deal of excitement. And from this tooth, which was believed to be human, the artists reconstructed Nebraska man together with his wife, and the tools that they were using, all based on that one single tooth. Well, some years later, they discovered additional remains of this creature. He turned out to be neither a man-like ape, nor an ape-like man. He turned out to be a pig. Now, pardon me for saying this, friends, and I know my evolutionist friends get upset with me when I do this. But it's true. This is a case of where the evolutionist made a man out of a pig and the pig made a monkey out of the evolutionist. And then in 1860, Neanderthal man was discovered. It was first believed that Neanderthal man was a cave-like creature, a cave man. He was a stereotypical grunting cave man. This is the way artists usually depict Neanderthal man in books and magazines. A long-armed, knuckle-dragging, beetle-browed, stoop-shouldered, bow-legged, sub-human caveman species. Yet, Neanderthal man's cranial capacity was larger than that of Homo sapiens, of modern human beings. And further research has shown that he had a very complex culture, that he would ceremonially bury his dead loved ones, which suggested religious beliefs, that he was highly artistic, as seen by the cave drawings, and that he used more complex tools, such as hand axes, spearheads, and sewing tools. The first specimens of Neanderthal man showed that the bones were bent, as you can see in this photograph. But it was eventually discovered that these primitive features were actually due to pathological conditions. This man was suffering from a lack of vitamin D. He had rickets. More than that, he had osteoarthritis. And he also suffered from syphilis. But further discoveries showed that actually Neanderthal man was a degenerate form of Homo sapiens. 
suffering from these various pathological conditions. Many other discoveries of Neanderthal man have been made and he has now been upgraded. He is no longer a subhuman species. In fact, as one scientist said, if you had to shave him, cut his hair, give him a bath and dress him in a suit, and if he had to walk down a street in one of our cities, nobody would even bat an eyelid. Neanderthals were clearly human and in no way qualify as a connecting link between apes and man. Friends, the field of paleoanthropology is a very controversial field. All the anthropologists disagree with one another. And if you want to go to a meeting where you see the sparks fly, just attend one of their congresses. There is disagreement about where man originally arose. In Africa, or in the Middle East, or in the Far East. Paleoanthropology has endured many heated controversies, and interpretations have been as numerous as their authors. Paleoanthropology is a science that is often short on data and long on opinion. So says Roger Lewin in his excellent book called Bones of Contention. The paucity of the human fossil record has left no alternative but to attempt to interpret often highly fragmentary remains. There is a tendency of some paleoanthropologists to make premature pronouncements based on preliminary examinations of sometimes inadequate specimens, to ignore alternate interpretations, and to echo prevailing theories of presupposition. Someone has referred to this field of study as a vicious, controversial, ego-laden, fun-driven field of one-upmanship. So much bias has accompanied the search for ancient human beings that it is often difficult to separate fact from fancy. As one scientist observes, how you read your evidence is at least partly conditioned by what you are expecting to find. This makes some paleoanthropologists less than objective, despite the clearly stated opinions of some of their contemporaries. Here we see a photograph of Louis Leakey and his wife, Mary, two very well-known paleoanthropologists. Mary Leakey had a more cautious approach to the scientific data and especially speculative theory. In an Associated Press interview three months before her death, she agreed it was impossible for scientists ever to pinpoint exactly when prehistoric man became fully human. We shall probably never know where humans began and where hominids left off, she said, since scientists can never prove a particular scenario of human evolution. Leakey said, all these trees of life with their branches of our ancestors are a lot of nonsense. What a frank admission by one of the world's leading anthropologists. Pullbeam had the following to say, my reservations concern not so much this book, but the whole subject of paleoanthropology. But introductory books or book reviews are hardly the place to argue that perhaps generations of students of human evolution, including myself, have been flailing about in the dark. That our database is too sparse, too slippery for it to be able to mold our theories. Rather, the theories are more statements about us and ideology than about the past. Paleoanthropology reveals more about how humans view themselves than it does about how humans came about. But that is heresy, he says. And Pullbeam is absolutely right. Professor Zuckerman from Birmingham University said the following, No scientist could logically dispute the proposition that man, without having been involved in any act of divine creation, evolved from some ape-like creature in a very short space of time, speaking in geological terms, without leaving any fossil traces of the steps of that transformation. And then in 2009, this skull was discovered. It was named Homo 
Florsiensis, the little people. Some scientists called them hobbits, and they were discovered on the island of Flores, Indonesia. Here we see the skull next to the skull of modern man. You can see that it is very much smaller. Here's another view of the skull. It is very clearly human-like, and they found tools with these individuals. These little people from the island of Flores were only 1.1 meter high. They were hominids that used spears to hunt pygmy elephants and Komodo dragons. They had small brains, yet there is evidence of stone tool use. Even more amazingly, they lived more recently than the Neanderthals. Which means that for thousands of years, modern humans and the hobbits lived at the same time and possibly had contact. A new study suggests that Homo sapiens caused the extinction of these tiny creatures. You see, friends, this was just an example of a small human species, like the pygmies of today, but they were human. And then in 2014, this skull was found right here in South Africa by Professor Lee Berger, and it was named Homo naledi. It became breaking news right around the world. And Lee Berger wrote this book with a title, Almost Human. This skull, and many like it, were found near Stadtfontein in the Denaledi chamber. And if you have a careful look at this chamber, you will see that there were narrow passages you had to go through in order to get down to the chamber bottom left. These creatures were very similar to other hominids in the following way. They had a human-like skull. They had small, gracile front teeth. They had human-like hands with opposite thumbs. Now, chimpanzees also have opposite thumbs. They had human-like feet with no opposable big toe as in chimps. So what makes them human? Why do they belong to the genus Homo? Well, the scientists believe that Homo naledi intentionally buried its dead in the difficult-to-reach, isolated Dinaledi cave chamber. And artists have depicted this as in this painting. Some believe that they actually buried their dead in the cave. And this is why Lee Berger and others believed they were human-like. But as I said, this cave, the Dinaledi cave, was very difficult to reach. There were some passages like Superman's crawl passage and the dragon's back passage, which were very, very narrow. How did they carry their dead through these narrow passages in the dark down to this chamber? Deliberate disposal of bodies would have required the hominins to find their way to the top of the chute through pitch black darkness and back again, which almost surely would have required light torches or fire lit at intervals. The notion of such a small brain creature exhibiting such complex behavior seems so unlikely that many researchers have simply refused to credit it. So once again, you see tremendous disagreement within and amongst the scientific fraternity. Here we see Dr. Lee Berger emerging from Superman's crawl. Can you see how narrow this passageway is? How Naledi managed this is inexplicable. They have no idea. It is unlikely that this creature had access to torches. Controlled use of fire came much later in history. So how does this creature, Homo Naledi, differ from man? Well, it had a much smaller brain cavity. It had pronounced eyebrow ridges. It had large, robust molars at the back of its mouth. It had a sloping, shovel-like face. And here we see it. Notice the skull is much, much smaller than that of a human. Notice that the skull is sloping. This is characteristic of other apes. Notice there are no nasal bones. Its hands were curved so that the fingers could grasp and hold onto branches. Here we see the curved fingers 
of this specimen. Here's another photograph. Once again, notice the curved fingers. Notice also the exceptionally large thumb, which is characteristic of the apes. It had ape-like shoulders, and no tools were found in the cave. The pelvis was like that of Lucy, with an iliac flair. The femur has a small head, a long neck with a bump of bone that points backwards. These features are seen in every Australopith femur. This creature had flat feet and toes that were slightly curved. It had the large thumb and it had no nasal bones, nor did it have a nasal spine. Friends, I would like to submit to you that this was not a creature that belonged to the homo genus. Was Naledi really a hominin? Or was it just another Australopithecine variety, a Lucy-type extinct ape similar to a chimp? You see, scientists become so excited when they discover a new skull that sometimes they jump to premature conclusions without listening to the opinions of other scientists that are working in the same field. I believe that Homo naledi was just another Australopithecine. It was not a hominid. And so once again, friends, we see the two lines. We have the Australopithecine group and we have the hominid group with lots of variety within each group. And then, friends, we have other skulls that have been found which challenge the present theory of evolution. For example, Castenodolo Man. In 1860, Prof. G. Ragazzoni, an experienced geologist, dug the skull out of the Pliocene sediments in northern Italy. The beds of clay and shells that overlay the skeleton, as well as other human fragments, bones of the thorax and the limbs, appeared undisturbed. Later he recovered more modern human fossils, to the astonishment of the world, including a man, a woman, and two children. This finding was suppressed and has found little publicity, as the layers, all water deposited, were dated at over four million years, as determined by uniform geologic means. So here we have a skull that is dated or that was older than all of these that we have already been speaking about. Giuseppe Sergi, famous anatomist of Rome, visited Ragazzoni in 1883 and verified the remains of the four individuals, an adult male, female, and two children. A noted authority of the day, Sergi believed that this skull was authentic. As the skeptical reactions flowed in from others, he later said, the tendency to reject, by reason of theoretical preconceptions, any discoveries that can demonstrate a human presence in the tertiary is, I believe, a kind of scientific prejudice. Natural science should be stripped of this prejudice. Later, Sergi wrote, by means of a despotic scientific prejudice, call it what you will, Every discovery of human remains in the Pliocene has been discredited. Now, friends, this is not the only skull that has been described or that has been found that is as old as this one. Others have also been found. Richard Lewontin, in his book Human Diversity, says the following. Despite the excited and optimistic claims that have been made by some paleontologists, no fossil hominid species can be established as our direct ancestor. In his excellent book, Bones of Contention, Roger Lewin says the following, Any theory of human evolution must explain how it was that an ape-like ancestor equipped with powerful jaws and long dagger-like canine teeth and able to run at speed on four limbs became transformed into a slow, bipedal animal whose natural means of defense was at best puny. Add to this the power of intellect, speech, and morality upon which we stand raised as upon a mountaintop, as Huxley put it, and one has the complete challenge to evolutionary theory. Friend, that is a very apt 
statement to make. And it is very, very true. Let us look at biochemistry and something which is referred to as irreducible complexity. In his book, The Origin of the Species, Darwin wrote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Well, friends, we need to remember that Darwin knew very little about biochemistry. There are incredibly complex biochemical reactions that take place within nature and within human cells. Let us look at the eye as an example. Could a high-definition colored television camera evolve by itself? There is no ways that such a thing could happen. But what about the human eye, which is much more complex than a television camera? Indeed, Darwin wrote, the thought of the eye and how it could possibly be produced by natural selection makes me ill. Here we see the rods and cones at the back of our retina. These are the light-sensitive cells in our eye. In his book called Darwin's Black Box, Michael B., a biochemist, speaks about mouse trap like mechanisms. And he says, by irreducibly complex, I mean a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, wherein the removal of any one of those parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. And so he uses the example of a mousetrap. A mousetrap is quite a simple little structure. It consists of a platform, a spring, a holding bar, a hammer, and a catch. But friends, all of those components need to be in place before that mousetrap can function. If you remove just one, it will not be able to function. All the working parts must not just be together, but have to be of the right material and in the correct placement. In the realm of nature, says Michael Behe, there are mousetrap-like systems that are irreducibly complex, so complex that it is scientifically impossible for those systems to have evolved piece by piece. The only way they could possibly function is if they were placed in operation in entirety and simultaneously as an irreducibly complex system. With all the pieces of the right material correctly positioned and set from the very beginning of its function as a system. Anything short of that and the system would have been defunct and the organism would have died. And so friends, let's look at the eye and the complex chemical reactions that take place within the eye of man. Light enters through the pupil of the eye, through the lens, and the photons strike the fovea centralis at the back of the eye. This is the photosensitive region at the back of the eyeball. And so light strikes the retina and reacts with a retinal molecule which immediately changes shape. The change in shape forces the protein rhodopsin to which this molecule is closely attached to change shape also. The change in shape of rhodopsin causes it to be attached to a second protein, transducin. When that happens, the transducin drops off a small molecule and accepts a slightly different one in its place. Transducin now binds to a third protein, phosphodiesterase, which has the ability to cut out a third molecule which reduces the number of positively charged sodium ions. The resulting imbalance of positive and negative sodium ions inside and outside the cell membrane causes an electrical charge that is transmitted down the optic nerve and is interpreted by the brain as vision. 
Friends, I have simplified this, but you can see that this is a highly complex set of reactions that takes place. But what actually happens in the brain to then produce vision is a whole other marvel of complexity. Friends, in order for us to see all these biochemical reactions must be in place. If anyone is missing, the eye would not be able to see. Now, B.E. gives many other examples in his book. For example, he mentions blood clotting, which also requires many, many complex chemical reactions to occur. If you are interested, you can refer to his book. And then there is the process of photosynthesis, which involves a very highly complex set of reactions. All of the molecules must be in place for this to occur. The same is true for energy production within the cell, within the mitochondria, where we have glycolysis and the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle taking place. A highly complex set of reactions. How do you explain all these irreducibly complex systems, Charles Darwin? How did it all get here? Every plant and animal on planet Earth would have died unless the entire system was in place. I rest my case, says Michael B. Friends, let's look at one more evidence for creation. We can refer to this as the so-called enigmatic animals, like the duck-billed platypus. Some animals, like the duck-billed platypus, have organs totally unrelated to their alleged evolutionary ancestors. The platypus has fur, is warm-blooded, and suckles its young, as do mammals. It lays leathery eggs, has a single ventral opening for waste elimination, mating, and birth, and has claws and a shoulder girdle as most reptiles do. The platypus can detect electrical currents as some fish do and as a bull somewhat like that of a duck. It has webbed forefeet like those of an otter, a flat tail like that of a beaver. The male can inject poisonous venom like a pit viper. Such patchwork animals called mosaics have no logical place on the so-called evolutionary tree. Let us bring this discussion to a conclusion by answering a few questions. What brings about evolution? Well, as we have already seen in the previous presentation, evolution, so say the Darwinists, is brought about by mutations. Something like a chemical or radiation, gamma radiation, can cause the genes to be destroyed, or it can change the sequence of the genes. Let us have a look at an example. Now, our genes are in triplets. There are three base pairs that make up a gene. And so, for example, the gene sequence would read as follows. Three letters in each word. The cat and the hat. But let's say a mutation takes place and C is deleted. Then the message changes and would read the utter ndat he at. As these genes now express themselves, changes would be expressed within the phenotype. But most mutations, 99.9% .9 of mutations, are heterozygous recessive and they are harmful to the animal. And so, for example, you would get a deformed jaw or you would get a featherless bird no longer able to fly or you would produce deformed wings or a missing lower jaw. Most mutations are harmful to the animal. Now, the evolutionist would say that changes take place due to natural selection, due to selection pressure that is placed upon an organism. For example, a lion will prey on a buck, but the buck over time would develop stronger muscles, would run faster, and that in turn would put selection pressure on the lion. 
So the lion in turn has to develop longer teeth, more powerful claws, more powerful muscles. And so selection pressure and natural selection brings about evolution. Let us look at a very good example that is used in many textbooks, the so-called pepper moth. Here we see the black variety of the moth against the lichen background on the bark of a tree. Can you see the light-colored pepper moth? Look carefully. There he is. But he is well camouflaged. Now the birds do not see the light pepper moth, and so they will go for the dark variety. And so the population of the dark variety is reduced, and the population of the lighter variety increases over time. But during the Industrial Revolution, as soot was pumped out into the atmosphere, the bark became dark. And now the black variety was well camouflaged, and the lighter variety was clearly visible to the predator. And so the population of the lighter variety goes down, and the population of the darker variety increases. Natural selection is working at the level of the phenotype. But please notice, friends, they are all still pepper moths. They are not changing into anything else. The same is true of the finches that Darwin discovered on the Galapagos Islands. There were a large variety of finches with different shaped beaks. Some were seed eaters. Some were fruit eaters eaters. Some ate insects. There was even one variety that used a little cactus thorn to dig out the insects under the bark of a tree. These organisms, these finches, adapted to different niches in order to obtain food. And so this is an example of what we can call adaptive radiation. Or, as some call it, microevolution. Changes within that group of organisms. But all of them are still finches. We can see the same in the dogs. There are many varieties of dog. But the dog must have come from one initial pair, the wild type or the wolf. But friends, through inbreeding, cross-breeding, selective breeding, hybridization, man has produced an endless variety of dogs. But they all are dogs. They all are able to breed and produce viable offspring. Here's another example. An endless variety of butterflies coming from the same gene pool. An endless variety of ladybirds. And the same is true for man. There are many variations within the human species. We have the mongoloid, the negroid, the caucasoid, and so on. So, once again, endless variety, but all human beings. Now, evolutionists look to mutations as being the process responsible for generating the new genetic information evolution requires, which is then sorted by natural selection. But natural selection is not evolution. Natural selection can eliminate genes that already exist, but it never creates new genetic information. Take, for example, the blind cave fish. This fish has lost its eyes over time because it doesn't need eyes in the dark caves where it lives. But its relative has eyes. Living in dark underwater caves, natural selection favors eyeless mutant fish over their sighted kin. Eyes in such an environment are a disadvantage as the delicate tissue is prone to injury as fish 
bump against sharp rocks in the darkness, becoming an entry point for potentially lethal bacteria. Eyelessness clearly represents a loss, not a gain. Yet leading evolutionists have claimed it as supporting their case. But evolution needs to invent eyesight, not to destroy it. Friends, here we see a diagram of the common fruit fly. Now this poor fellow has been bombarded with x-rays, gamma rays, chemicals of all sorts to try and bring about evolution. You see it reproduces very quickly, produces offspring, and the generation is very short. So scientists are able to track one generation to the next. Scientists have tried their best to bring about evolution within the fruit fly, but all that it has produced is some with wings, some without wings, some with curly wings, some that are ebony-bodied, some that are sepia-eyed, and some that have barred eyes. Many varieties have been produced, but they are still all fruit flies. It is very much like playing a piano. A piano has what? 88 keys. Yet, you can sit down at the piano and play an endless variety of tunes with just 88 keys. Friends, God has built into our genetic makeup within the billions of base pairs the possibility for endless variety. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, there's an endless variety of possibilities that could occur. God has built the variation into our gene code and into the gene pool. And this proves to me that he is a God of incredible creativity. In his book, The Wedge of Truth, Philip Johnson says the following, it has been 140 years since Darwin introduced his theory to the world. And what do we have to show for it? For all the brave talk about evolution as an established fact, much of the evidence actually seems to run against Darwinism. As for example, fossils that don't show creatures gradually changing, but rather staying the same. Yet Darwinists so want the theory to be true, they obscure the evidence. Just when and where will Darwinists demonstrate that one species typically becomes something completely different? Friends, that's a very, very good question. Many of the younger scientists today are rejecting hardcore Darwinism. Many of them are speaking about intelligent design. And so we have a new breed of scientists. The older scientists cling to Darwin and to Darwinism. But the younger scientists are thinking differently. Darwin is indeed on trial. Let us have a look at one example that is always used in textbooks and in museums to try and prove the theory of evolution. It is a so-called evolution of the horse. And here is the typical sequence. But friends, Eohippus, right at the bottom, is not a horse. The scientist who first classified the fossil labeled it Hyracotherium, which means an animal like a hyrex. The other fossils are simply variations within the horse family. So once again, here we have an example of microevolution. They are all horses. And we see that variation to this very day. Here we have some miniature horses, but at the other end of the scale, we have giant horses like this one. This just shows variation within the gene pool. 
And so, friend, I ask you the question, which model does the evidence fit best? Creation or evolution? I believe that the first verse in the Bible states the truth as it is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the basic kinds of animals and plants. But over the years, plants and animals had to adapt. They had to adapt to climatic changes and other factors in the environment. Natural selection could have taken place. Different varieties were produced. But all the animals within a certain kind were essentially the same because that is the way God created them. But someone will say, how do you explain the geological column? The fact that the simpler animals, and by the way, you will remember in our previous presentation, there is no such thing as a simple organism. The simpler organisms tend to be at the bottom and the more complex organisms tend to be at the top of the column. Well, friends, Dr. Harold Clark has come up with a theory which he calls ecological zonation. And here we have a diagrammatic representation of this theory, showing how animals could be buried in a roughly predictable order by rising floodwaters. This next slide will show it in more detail. At the bottom we have what he called the lowlands, and at the top we have the uplands. And this corresponds more or less to the geological column. So at the bottom we have the Paleozoic, in the middle we have the Mesozoic, and at the top we have the Tertiary. During the flood, the animals in the lowlands would have been the first to be buried by mud flows and turbidity currents. These would be those animals that we find in the Cambrium, for example. And so, as we go higher up, so the different animals would have been buried in the different strata as they were laid down in the geological column. There are many flood legends in the world, and these flood accounts were handed down through generations and probably date back to the actual event recorded in the Bible. A second factor which we need to look at is motility. Ambulatory animals would likely try to escape the rising flood water by fleeing to higher ground. Now certain animals like the trilobites were not very fast movers and so they were the first to be buried when the flood waters rose. A third factor which needs to be taken into account is flotation. Flotation research has shown that amphibian bodies sink first, followed by reptiles, mammals and birds, a sequence similar to that in the geological column. And so friends, we do have models that can adequately explain the geological column from a creationist point of view. Finally, I would like to look at some fossil anomalies. Fossils that are difficult to explain. Here we see a hammer made from an alloy of iron, which is very modern in technology, encased in early Cretaceous rock, dated at 140 million years old. The handle has already colified in parts. Paleontologist Jerry MacDonald discovered these fossil footprints in New Mexico in 1987. Footprints of other animals were also found, but MacDonald was at a loss to explain how these human footprints could have been cast in Permian strata dated at 248 million years. This is indeed a fossil anomaly. Here we see a fossilized human hand discovered in Bogota, Colombia in rock dated at 100 to 130 million years old. Here we see an artifact that was found within a coal seam. Pennsylvania carboniferous coal containing an iron pot discovered by Frank Cannard in Oklahoma. The coal from which the pot was extracted is dated at 395 million years. The man-made artifact still has residue of coal adhering to the inside bottom. And here we see a bell 
that was discovered within a coal seam. And here, friends, are sandal-like footprints with trilobites, Cambrian slate stone containing a human sandal print with embedded trilobite fossils, assigned an evolutionary age of 550 million years. The sandal print still bears depressions of the stitching along the sides. Wear on the outside of the heel area is consistent with human locomotion. So these are just a few anomalies that evolutionists find very, very difficult to explain. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3 verses 3 to 5 said, You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming he promised? But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed. And so, friends, in the last days, we will have many, many scoffers. Scoffing at the idea that God created the heaven and the earth. Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And then finally, in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, we have the three angels' messages going to the world just before Jesus returns the second time. John is in vision and he says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him. Why are we to worship Him? Because He made or created the heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This portion of scripture, dear friends, is telling us that just before Jesus returns, the world's attention will be brought back to the fact that God is the awesome creator of heaven and earth. Both creation and evolution are inferences. But the evidence, I believe, is overwhelmingly in favor of creation. And I still believe that the most powerful statement is found in the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we have examined the evidence which seems to point to the fact that you indeed are the awesome creator of heaven and earth. You created all life. Everywhere we look, we see evidence of intelligent design. Dear Lord, we bow before the King of the universe. We acknowledge you as our awesome Creator God. We give our hearts to you. We desire to learn more of you. Help us to have open mind. Help us to search your will. And help us to follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is my humble prayer. In His name. Amen. Oh,